Today I'm going to talk about the results of a two-year study uh, asking the question, why do frogs uh, breed when they breed? Um, very relevant to uh, the previous two talks. And uh, some of this information has just come together in the last few weeks. Uh, it took us a long time to compile all the data and, and do all the analysis, but uh, we're just, just finally getting there. So uh, this is my first test to try to uh, convince you of these results. <clears throat> so move this forward. Is that how it works? Down, okay. For uh, the past four years, we have uh, been contracted by PG&E to conduct amphibian surveys on the North Fork Feather River as part of their hydroelectric uh, relicensing studies. And during that time, we have seen substantial variation in the uh, day of the year that frogs breed. And this is always a particular concern because we're making repeated uh, trips to the site and um, when, when, does, uh, when does it all start? Um, and it's varied over the last four years uh, from as early as May 9th to this year as late as May 30th. So this pattern uh, intrigued us and uh, sort of became the, uh, uh, the, the origins of this study. And during this time we've also uh, suspected uh, or we've, we think we've observed this pattern of frogs living on the tributaries and moving uh, to the main stem river to breed sometime during the spring. And uh, so, as, as Sarah mentioned, there's uh, big consequences for when you breed because if you breed too early and the flows are high, the water drops down and your egg masses are high and dry. Uh, uh, and alternatively, if you lay them too early and there's still a big pulse flow, they'll be scoured and probably washed downstream uh, and lost. So our, our primary questions were to uh, determine if there were or what, and what they are environmental triggers associated with initial movement from uh, tributary refuges uh, down to the river to breed. And once you get to the river, what are the environmental conditions that uh, uh, leads you to start breeding. Secondary objectives of the study were to determine how uh, pulse, uh, pulse flows or irregular flow releases associated with dams might affect these patterns and uh, to try to figure out how frogs use the tributaries as movement corridors and finally to look at uh, impact of culverts on frog movements. Our study area was uh, uh, on the North Fork Feather River, just above Lake Orville, and included two reaches of the uh, uh, of this highly regulated river. Uh, the Po Reach is just above Lake Orville, and it's about 14 kilometers long, and it's maintained at about 110 uh, cubic feet per second, so fairly low base flow. And uh, there's there's three study tributaries on that reach. On the Crestor Reach, which is just upstream separated by a dam and a, and a small reservoir. Uh, there's the Crestor Reach, and that's about 10 kilometers long, and it's at, maintained at 220 uh, cubic feet per second, so fairly, uh, fairly low base flows. And uh, it's unique in that it's had uh, uh, whitewater recreational flows that go uh, to about 1,000 to 1,600 cubic feet per second uh, one weekend a month. They suddenly uh, raise it up, similar to South Fork American, but only on a monthly basis. And uh, three tributaries there as well. Our study methods were to conduct uh, repeated surveys of these six tributaries uh, every other day during uh, uh, the spring breeding season in, in both years. In 2004, we relied exclusively on visual surveys. And uh, this last year, we also added telemetry to 46 female frogs and, and six male frogs. And we alternated, uh, again, between the six uh, tributaries, trying to get them every other day. Uh, this past year, we started in uh, February 14th, and the previous year, we, we didn't start until uh, April. But in both years, we continued through, uh, through mid-June. For each frog that we captured, uh, we recorded the sex, the weight, uh, the length. And for female frogs, uh, 
we recorded their condition as either gravid or spent. Uh, each frog, and this is a real critical part uh, of the study, we determined its location uh, as the number of meters from the um, confluence with the main stem. And uh, we recorded the identity in sort of a novel way, not, not terribly novel. I think Clara Wheeler put a paper out on this last year that these uh, chin patterns are uh, the same year after year after year. So uh, if you take a picture of the, the frog's chin, uh, and we also took a picture of the flank, these can be subsequently matched up. Um, there is some variation in the darkness of the, the modeling, but the pattern is always the same. Uh, so by matching up uh, repeated captures of the frogs and comparing their locations, that's how we determined uh, when they were moving. Uh, but it was very delayed gratification. Uh, in other words, we didn't find out until we got back to the office, you know, that frog was here on one day and down the river the next day. Um, so uh, we recorded all this information on frogs in order to determine movement periods. And then we recorded information on egg masses uh, using Gosner, uh, Gosner's table of end urine development so we could backdate egg masses that we observed uh, to determine when frogs bred. At the same time, we collected, as we were collecting information on frogs and breeding, we also collected uh, all, all this information on weather conditions. Uh, air and uh, precipitation were recorded at a nearby weather station. Uh, there was uh, gauging stations uh, installed and maintained by pg and &E in each reach. Uh, and we had uh, data loggers in each study tributary and in each reach, and we also had staff gauges in each tributary. So here's all of the data. I wish, uh, one, is it the red button, the uh, pointer? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Okay. So uh, here's all of the data, all of the frog data. Uh, the movement data for males is here. This is the first male that moved uh, about February 23rd. Um, the last one was somewhere out here in April, and that's the mean movement date for male frogs on Flea Valley Creek in 2005. And here is the, uh, the movement period for females. Uh, it's a bit shorter window, and it's a bit later. And down here is all the breeding. This is about eight egg masses, um, all laid after this big, uh, big spring uh, peak that we had. Um, other information down here in brown is uh, uh, rainfall, and uh, you have tributary temperature and uh, main stem temperature uh, increasing as the season goes on. So our question was really, how are these environmental factors, uh, are they triggering movements and breeding? Uh, what's, what's the relationship here? Did I skip? Okay, yep. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into some of our, our results here. Um, first of all, we had a lot of frogs. We caught 476 frogs over the two years, 476 individuals. Uh, that's the number down here. Um, that included uh, quite a range of densities. Uh, our best tributary, uh, 6C, had 198 individuals, and uh, our worst tributary had only five uh, frogs observed during two years of the study. Um, so there's a lot of variation. Uh, for initial movements, uh, as you saw on the previous slide, males initiated movements to the river before females about uh, uh, a month earlier, and they also stayed on the river a uh, much longer period of time. But when we, uh, because we started late in 2004, we didn't have two years of males, so we could only test the difference between years uh, for females. So we looked at, uh, first of all, a pair t-test, if there's any uh, difference between the breeding date between years, and it wasn't only not, was it, it wasn't different, it was the same day on the Po Reach, it was May 4th in both years, and it was four days different uh, on the crest to reach. So uh, we said, yeah, it must be day of the year that triggers initial movement. Uh, but we did a second test to compare uh, conditions uh, just prior to breeding. And we chose a, uh, 
somewhat arbitrary date of five days. So if there was an environmental trigger, air temperature, water temperature, uh, flow level, uh, you'd expect it to be different when frogs moved from the time just prior to that. But there was, the, it was no different. So it really seems like day length is what triggered uh, these frog movements. Uh, some sort of extra information we got along the way was the, some of the movement rates. Females move twice as fast as males, about 50 meters a day versus 26 meters a day uh, on average. And the longest distance movement was almost two kilometers. And that was a trip that was made in less than six days uh, and included time for breeding on the river. So it's a, it's a real underestimate. They're, they're fast moving frogs uh, when they want to be. Um, and we calculated the mean uh, time spent on the river. Uh, males, as I said, spent much longer the time than females. It doesn't show up too well in the, uh, in the mean, uh, 6.3 for males and 4.2 for females. But uh, when you see the maximum time on the river, we had one male that was out there for over three months. And uh, the female uh, was only out there for close to uh, one month. So on the breeding uh, date, we did the same type of analysis here to see if there was differences between years. And of, of course, there were differences between years, but there were also different differences in environmental conditions. So then we looked, uh, because females were on the river for an average of 4.2 days, we compared conditions when they bred to conditions five days earlier. Again, somewhat of an arbitrary comparison, but if there's an environmental trigger, we'd expect some difference. Uh, in those uh, values. Uh, and there were some differences, but none of them were, were significant except for the 500 uh, CFS flow difference on the Po reach. Um, however, there were some characteristics of the time that they bred, or you know, seemed to be very strong thresholds. River temperature was always 10 degrees centigrade, and river flow level was less than 55% of the base flow. Here's a uh, graph showing just that uh, factor. Um, all the breeding occurred between 10 degrees centigrade and 16 degrees centigrade, and it was all clustered below about 55% of uh, base flow conditions. There were six frogs that, led, uh, that bred during high flow conditions, and I think those are very interesting. Uh, what we'll see is that those frogs, here's one of them right here on the Po Reach, bred at a fairly high flow level. I can't tell exactly what it is. I think it's 800 CFS on a reach that's maintained at 110, uh, but it is at the declining limb of the hydrograph. So I think that was a key thing that, that frogs were uh, focused on. Um, you can see that both years uh, had high flows on this reach, nearly 20,000 uh, in 2004 and nearly 15,000 in 2005. So even though it's a dam regulated reach, uh, it does spill uh, regularly and there's, there's fairly high flows. Um, I'll close with a, a bit of a non sequitur, but uh, we also looked at frog movements and found that frogs move through culverts and, and all over the place uh, very easily. Um, we only observed three frogs in culverts, but um, have evidence that they moved up and down through these without any problem. One frog did get trapped inside of the casing around a culvert and was subsequently re recovered dead, and uh, in general they didn't uh, affect frogs except for one uh, tributary, uh, uh, Cedar Creek, where we only had five frogs observed over the two years. Uh, this is it right here. It's an 80-meter waterfall to the river, and uh, the culvert that's uh, at the top of the photo here is uh, 60 meters long, goes under the railroad, and it's at a high gradient. And uh, it's like the, sh the photos Ryan showed. It's very difficult to imagine how a frog could get back into it, and we think that contributed to the low population at that site. And I just want to acknowledge our funding source was the California Energy Commission and uh, the uh, UC, group, UC um, Davis um, Center for Aquatic Biology and Agriculture uh, uh, managed the contract, Simpson Young and, and Doug Conklin in particular, and um, all the rest of the folks from PG&E that helped us out. <laughs>